is Clyde Robertson. I'm the director of this very new but very important program, department, the Department of African and African American Studies. And welcome to a morning with Sonia Sanchez. At this point, I will bring to the fore the chairperson of the Louisiana League of Good Governments annual luncheon, Mrs. Gloria Donata. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning to everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, great. That was great. <laughs> Today is a beautiful day. It's made even more beautiful by having our special guest. On behalf of the officers, the board members, and members of the Louisiana League of Good Government, I welcome you to this morning's session, Morning with the Author, Sonia Sanchez, which, as was stated by Mr. Robertson, is a joint venture. The African, African American Studies and Culture Department of the New Orleans Public Schools is indeed a very important part of the school system. We welcome this opportunity. The Louisiana League of Good Government, LOG, to shorten it, was established in 1963 to promote good government through an informed and active citizenry and to encourage responsibility, particularly in the black community, as far as government is concerned. Membership is open to any person who subscribes to the purpose of LOG. At this time, I'd like to acknowledge some of our members who may be present with us this morning. I see one board member, Mrs. Dolores Robertson, who incidentally is the mother of your host, Clyde Robertson. Stand, Mrs. Robertson. Uh, I'd like to ask other members of LOG, and you'll have to help me out here, because the light is just a little bright, and I perhaps cannot see you if you're sitting in the rear. But if indeed you are a member of LOG, will you please stand? We may have one or two others who are able to be with us, with us this morning. Of course, as working uh, people, we indeed have to take care of business. Uh, I'd like to put in a plug, actually, for an event that is taking place on tomorrow. Uh, for those who may be able to make it, tomorrow at 12 o'clock noon, we will indeed log, we'll host our annual membership luncheon. This will take place at the Sheraton Hotel, and that's on the eighth floor, the Armstrong Ballroom. We will indeed be featuring Ms. Sonia Sanchez as our guest speaker, and she will share even more. Our tickets are nominal. We haven't gone up over the years. The price is still $20. So if indeed you would like to have more of Sonia Sanchez, we welcome you to come out and join us and having a delicious lunch and also a beautiful session, extended session with Sonia Sanchez. This morning, we are indeed fortunate to have a widely acclaimed poet, playwright, activist, editor, mother, national and international lecturer. She is recognized as a political activist for black culture, racial, racial justice, women's liberation and peace, and as one of the most prolific and influential living African American writers. She's the author of 13 books, including Homecoming, We Are Bad, People, Liberation Poems, Love Poems, I've Been a Woman, New and Selected Poems, Home Girls and Hand Grenades, and Under a Soprano Sky. Her published plays include The Bronx is Next, Sister Sanji, Malcolm Man Don't Live Here No More. Dirty Hearts, and I'm black when I'm singing, I'm blue when I ain't. 
Her recordings encompass Sonia Sanchez, We Are Bad People, A Sun, a sun Lady for All Seasons Reads Her Poetry, and Capturing Facts About the Heritage of Black Americans. In addition to being a contributing editor to the Journal of African Studies and the Black Scholar, she has edited two anthologies, We Be Word Sorcerers, 25 Stories by Black Americans, and 360 Degrees of Blackness Coming at You. She is the recipient of a National Endowment for the Arts, the Lucretia Mott Award for 1984, the Outstanding Arts Award from the Pennsylvania Coalition of 100 Black Women, the Community Service Award from the National Black Caucus of State Legislators, the winner of the 1985 American Book Award for Home Girls and Hand Grenades, the Governor's Award for Excellence in the Humanities for 1988, Peace and Freedom Award from Women International League for Peace and Freedom, 1989-90, and a Pew Fellowship in the Arts for 1992-93. Our guest speaker has traveled extensively, including Cuba, the People's Republic of China, the West Indies, England, Australia, the Caribbean, Nicaragua, Norway, Canada, and more than 500 universities and colleges in the United States to give readings for which she is still in demand. She was the first presidential fellow at Temple University and holds the Laurel Cornell Chair in English at Temple University. Perhaps Gloria Wade Gale said it best when she wrote, there is no mistaking the signature of Sonia. Palpitating passion, provocative questions and disturbing answers, fresh and dazzling images, rhythms that you can dance to, run to, think to, rage to, details, the smallest of details, that sp with sprinkle, sprinkles like glitter in every line, power and force, message and craft that are the hand grenades of her truth. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, will you please join me now in welcoming our guest, Sonia Sanchez. Thank you. What a pleasure it is to being here in New Orleans and looking at all of you. And I want to thank you for coming out this morning uh, to this assembly. I want to thank um, Mr. Clyde Robinson and then Mrs. Donato. I want to thank uh, the League for having me here in New Orleans. But I want to thank most especially all of you young people for coming here today. Uh, listening to someone who's going to read some poetry, but also who will talk to you about, I guess, some things that you're all thinking about. I want to tell you a, a joke that my father tells about being black in a place called America. I want you to listen to it very carefully. My father tells the joke about the first black pilot in America. And what that's what that is about is that some of you know that sometimes we did not um, fly as African Americans, you know? But my father tells a joke about the first black pilot in the, 19, the late 1940s after World War II. He tell, this plane was leaving from a place called New York City. And people got on the plane and they looked into the cockpit and they saw this black man there. At the time they called him a Negro if you understand the times, the 1940s, right? And so the people looked inside and saw this Negro standing there, and they said, uh, 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 
they talk to the stewardess. Uh, 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 I'm uh, um, um, uh, uh, tell me, uh, uh, stewardess, uh, is that a, a Negro uh, in there in the cockpit? And so the stewardess's name was, Jan was Janice, and she said, well, just a minute, people, don't get upset. Let me go and talk to our captain. His name is Captain Jack Jones. So she goes into the cockpit, and she says to Jack, she says, Jack, Jack, I told you, I told you, you shouldn't have left the door open. Now people have seen you, and they're upset. He says, you know, Janice, don't worry about a thing. I'll talk to the people on the intercom, and he does. He goes on the intercom, and he says, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Captain Jack Jones. I am your pilot for this trip to LA today from LaGuardia in New York City. But before we begin our trip to LA, let me tell you just a little bit about myself. I am a graduate of Harvard University. I am also a graduate of Yale University. I am also a graduate of MIT. I am also a graduate of Oxford University. And then during World War II, I taught all of the pilots how to fly. So if you would just settle down and calm down, I will see if I can get this big motherfucker off the ground. That's an example of black humor. And black humor in America talks a great deal about having to strive against great odds to do things. To be a pilot, you gotta be all of that. Can you imagine? Not just go to pilot school, but be, have all those degrees. But there is running around in America other kinds of jokes. Like the joke when I was at a, you go to these banquets sometimes to speak. And some guy before me got up to say something. He was telling some jokes. And we finally finished telling these two jokes. I got up and said, I'm offended by those jokes because that is not about black humor. He tells a joke about what is the hardest, what is the hardest, the hardest 10 years of a black boy's life? Answer, third grade. You gotta hear the difference between the first joke and the second joke. And the second joke, he says, tell me, we were trying to figure out why did so many black men die in doing Vietnam? Because when they said, get down, all the black guys stood up and did it and got shot. Third joke, he told. You gotta hear the difference. The jokes are running around and all of us, I don't care what color you be, how you got to understand that if you laugh at jokes that demean one group, you laugh, you'll, the people will tell jokes about you, any other kind of group, you know what I'm saying? So we must understand what it means to be human on this earth. The last joke that was told is that um, this black guy was stranded on an island and this bottle rolled in and out popped a Jenny. Jenny said, Jenny said um, to the black guy, you have two wishes, what are they? The black guy says, I want to be white. Jenny said, poof, you're white. And so the black guy was bouncing around there and said, ooh, ooh. So the Jenny said, what's your next one? She says, I don't ever want to have to work again another day in my life. So the Jenny says, fine, poof, you're black. You hear it. You hear it. You got to hear it. And that's the kind of joke that is going around as opposed to the first kind of joke that we tell. And sometimes we have to catch ourselves from laughing because we have to examine the jokes and understand how to demean people. Because those jokes, those last three jokes, demean people. Do you hear what I'm saying? They demean a group saying you cannot do and you will not do. And I want you as young people to understand that you're put on this earth not to demean people. You're put on this earth to walk upright. That is very hard and difficult to do because you're involved with a country that wants you to demean yourselves, that wants you, if you're a young African-American male or if you're a young male, period, to look at black women and or to look at women, period, and think, hey, they, all they need to do is like, you know, I'm just gonna go hump that person, you know what I'm saying? Or to watch MTV, come on. You see black men on MTV singing a song, great voices, great voices, but all they do is that, <laughs> you know. And you say, well, brother, it's there still. <laughs> it ain't gone. 
or watch the sisters who say, come out and say, I have talent. <laughs> Isn't the truth? Women in a state of undress. And then you see little children who come around and imitate that, you see. And we're saying simply, you have to stop and think, why does the country want you to be involved so early with sex at six, seven, eight, nine, ten, as opposed uh, to being involved with books, you know, humanity, learning, huh, being human towards each other, but sex all the time, so you don't have to deal with the things that go on in our neighborhoods, like in our neighborhoods where we live, people will be dealing crack. So you don't have to deal with that at all, you know what I'm saying? Or where you live, you don't have decent meats, de decent vegetables, decent housing, you see. But you're involved with sex all day long. That's what I want to do. That's what I want to do. That's all I want to do, whatever. So you have to stop and think about why that and not the reality of what goes on in the world. So if you remember no poem that I say today, remember that there are people who want you to walk upright. You're on two feet, people. Not on four feet. I saw a young sister on an MTV video. I was doing a, 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 um, a talk, and I had to write a speech, and I had to write a speech about the music. And this young sister was on all fours, going across the floor, you know, looking and laughing towards this guy who was gyrating towards her. Think about how, just think about how we are supposed to walk upright. And you think about what you read in the newspapers about people talking about, yeah, I belong to this posse, I belong to this, and all we do is go out and we have 25 women. Well, I had 25 women in one week. You have to stop and think why someone would want to have 25 women in one week, first of all. I mean, how tiring that must be. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it's real. Really. But it brings you full circle, young men. If you read African American literature, there is a story by William Wells Brown called Stud Negro. Hear me. And in it, the master on the plantation is talking to his friend from New York. And he says to his friend, I want you to meet. I want you to meet one of my slaves named Jim. He said, hey, Jim, Jim boy, come over here. And Jim comes over and said, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, boss. I, I, I's here. Uh, Jim boy, tell my friend uh, John from New York City how many children you have. Listen. Jim boy said, well, sir, I has on this here plantation about 20. And then on, on yonder Mr. Brown's plantation, I has uh, uh, about 30 chillings. And then over there on, on, on Mr. James's plantation, I has uh, another 25. And the man from New York was amazed. Ooh, well, that's what you were raised for. What slave men were raised for was one thing. When we were enslaved, you were raised for one thing if you're a male. Not to think, not to read, not to be in quotes human but to do one thing, that is to impregnate women. And that was it, make babies. And if you were a black woman, if you were enslaved, if you were this black woman during slavery, if you were enslaved, all you're supposed to do is to work, right? You know, and give birth, 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 until you died. And if you really listen very carefully to America, they said, if I think you're still a slave or enslaved, that's what you should do, young girl, if you're 10 years of age, if you're nine years of age, if you're eight years of age, if you're seven years of age, if you're 11 years of age, give birth because you're still a slave. Give birth because you're still a slave. Give birth because you're still a slave. Give birth because you're still enslaved. And if you're a black guy, huh, huh, and you think you hit, huh, stick it to her, stick it to her, stick it to her, because that's all you is, still a slave because you don't think. Think about that. A country that wants you to do that and not deal with your humanity and to grow up and to deal with the world on your terms. Hmm? Think about that. In this world that we're moving to the 21st century, you still have people making you believe and think simply that all you can do, all you can do is give birth, give birth, give birth, and have babies, have babies. We love you. 
be you black, white, green, purple, blue, brown, we love you because we need you. You're the most intelligent group of children, young people, young adults we've ever had on the planet Earth. And you are beautiful. And sometimes you don't even see your beauty. You are indeed fantastic. And sometimes you don't understand how fantastic you are. Because you are the people that gave us rap. Come on, people. Some fantastic words and songs. Sometimes you demean people in your raps. But you, in a sense, reinvented yourselves. You said to the world, think about it. Years, some more than 10 years ago, you started doing rap and no one wanted to touch your songs. Isn't that something? And you used to do it on tapes and pass it back and forth and it began to make lots of money. Then the powers that be said simply, we're gonna come get some of your money. And you are geniuses. And some of you unrealized geniuses. And we say unto you, we want you to realize your genius in your time, at this particular time. So I just wanted to say that to you before I read some poetry to let you know just really simply what we do think about you and how important you are to all of us. I want to read a, a piece called Norma. I grew up in New York City. And uh, when I moved to New York City and went to school for the first time in my life, I saw people who didn't like me because I was um, in a classroom because I was black. And so it meant that people did not always um, treat you right. You know what I'm saying in the classroom? Well, in my class, I had this teacher who could not, who could not teach math. But we had a mathematical genius in our class by the name of Norma. I was a child who stuttered in class. You know, when I raised my hand, I would raise my hand and go, ah, 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 ah. By the time I got out, everyone had disappeared. I mean, the teacher folded up her books, closed her books, up, heading for the door. You know what I'm saying? People moaned and groaned in the classroom about me. But I couldn't figure out the factoring. Because you know how in the books when they teach you mathematics, at some point they don't teach it all. And it's up to the teacher who's supposed to know how to teach it to teach the rest to you. But we had teachers who couldn't do that. So I raised my hand to ask for help. And the teacher just would say, uh, 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 it's in the book, it's in the book, son, you do it. But we had what we called the bad kids in the back of the class. That is the bad kids who sat in the back, they wore leather jackets, their little black berets, you know, their little leather skirts, you know, and their little black shoes. And they were bad, they used to walk into class like, you know. I mean, they came in to take over the class, if you know what I'm saying. We were what they called, you see how tall I am now. We were called like the little goody goody kids, you know. We sat up front, you know. You know, I guess you call them dorks today, you know, or whatever, you know. I'm, I'm so happy to be in school. Well, we, we were. I liked school. And my father was a teacher, so in, in a sense, I had to like school, if you know what I mean. But we said up front, so when I raised my hand, one of the so-called bad persons uh, in, in the, um, the back of the room, her name was Odessa, said, hey, uh, uh, shut up, Sonia, sit down, and told Norma to go up front to teach me how to do this mathematics. Um, I saw Norma some years later on 145th Street in New York City in Amsterdam Avenue walking towards me with four, three or four little girls. She had tracks on her arms and legs. You know what I mean when I say tracks on her arms and legs? Yeah, she was on drugs. And this genius, this mathematical genius, uh, had not continued school at all. Let me tell you a little bit about Norma. And if you want to have any questions at that time, you can, no, you can ask them or talk, talk back to me with a dialogue. Sure, okay. This is called Norma. As a teenager, I was very shy. I always felt so conspicuous that I talked with my head down, walked with my head down, and would have slept with my head down if sleeping had demanded a standing position. It was with difficulty that I mustered up courage to ask Mr. Castor again and again, but, 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 but how do, do, do you factor that equation? I don't. Understand how e 
it's done. And he kept pointing to the book and looking upward as if the combination of those actions would give me the immediate joy of an answer. A sound from the back of the class made me turn around. It was the people, the people who sat in the back and talked when they wanted to, ate their lunches when they wanted to, and paid attention when they wanted to. They were paying attention to Mr. Castor and me, and I shook. I always wanted to be inconspicuous around the people. Odessa screamed, sit down, Mr. Castor. You don't know crap. Norma, go up front and teach that little pipsqueak how to do this algebra. As Mr. Castor moved to the sidelines like some dejected player, Norma got up and began her slow walk up to the blackboard. Have you ever seen a river curve back on itself? That was Norma as she walked on the edge of the classroom. She was heavy with white petticoats as she questioned, what do you want to know, Sonia? Indeed. What did I want to know? It was all so very simple. I just wanted to know how to factor the problems so I could do my homework, nothing else. I had a father waiting for me at home who would take no excuses concerning homework. He said, the teachers are there. If you don't know, ask them. They know the answers. He didn't know Mr. Castor, though. As I asked the question, she sighed and explain the factoring process in such an easy manner. I wrote it all down and closed my math notebook. I could do my homework now. There would be no problem with the family. Norma was still at the blackboard. She hadn't moved, and I knew that she was waiting for Lewis to say something. Lewis was the other brain in the class. They were always discussing some complex math problem. As if on cue, Lewis called out a more difficult question. She smiled, the smile ripened on her mouth like palm granites. Her fingers danced across the board. I watched her face. I was transfixed by her face that torpedoed the room with brilliance. She pirouetted problem after problem on the blackboard. We all thought genius. Norma is a mathematical genius. I used to smile at Norma and sometimes she smiled back. She was the only one in the group who spoke to the pipsqueaks sitting up front. The others spoke, but it was usually a command of sorts. Norma would sometimes shake off her friends and sit down with the pipsqueaks and talk about the South. She was from Mississippi. She ordained us all with her red clay Mississippi talk. Her voice thawed us out from the merciless cold studying the hallways. Most of the time, though, she laughed only with her teeth. One day, Norma called out a question in our French class. I understood the question. French was my favorite class. Mrs. Lefebvre was startled. She was a hunchback who swallowed her words, so it was always difficult to understand her. But Norma's words were clear. Mrs. Lefebvre spoke her well-digested English. No rudeness, please, Norma. You are being disrespectful. I shall not tolerate this. Norma continued the conversation in French. Her accent was beautiful. I listened while her words fell like mangoes from her lips. The people laughed. Talk that talk, Norma. Go on, girl. Keep on doing it, whatever you saying. Mayhem, the smell of mayhem stalked the room. I wondered if the people would lock us all in the closet again. Mrs. Lefebvre screamed, silence, 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 savages. How dare you ask me about my affliction? It is none of your business. As she talked, her large owl head bobbed up and down on her waist. I wondered if she would tr have trouble each night taking off her black dress. Her head was so large. Norma stood up and started to pack her books. The noise subsided. She walked to the door, turned, and said, I just wanted to talk to you in your own language so you wouldn't be so lonely. You always look so lonely up there behind your desk. But screw you, you old bitch. You can go straight to hell for all I care, hunchback and all. She exited. The others followed. 
dragging their feet and mumbling black morning words. Mrs. Afeb stood still like a lizard gathering the sun. I never liked that class after that. I still got good grades, but Norma, when she came to the French class, just sat and watched us struggle with our accents in amusement. I wondered what she did after school. I wondered if she ever studied. George Washington High School was difficult. Our teachers had not prepared us for high school. The first year was catch-up time. My sister and I spent long nights in our small room reading and studying our material. I don't remember who it was. It was announced one day at lunchtime that Norma was pregnant. She had been dismissed from school. I had almost forgotten Norma, the mathematical genius. Norma, the linguist. The year had demanded so much work and old memories and faces had faded into the background. I was rushing to the library. The library had become my refuge during the summer. As I turned the corner of 145th Street, I heard her hello. Her voice was like stale music in bar rooms. There she stood, Norma, eyelids heavy, woman of four children with tracks running on her legs and arms. How you be doing, Norma? You looking good, girl. I'm making it, Sonia. You really do look good, girl. Heard you went on to Hunter College. Glad you made it. You should have gone to Norma. You were the genius, the linguist. You were the brain. We just studied and got good grades. You were the one who understood it all. And I started to cry. On that summer afternoon, I heard a voice from very far away paddling me home to a country of incense, to a country of red clay. I heard her laughter dancing with fireflies. Tongue-tied by time and drugs, she smiled a funny smile and introduced me to her girls, four beautiful girls. Norma predicted that they would make it. They wouldn't be like their mother. They would begin with a single step. Then they would jump mountains. I agreed, she agreed, we agreed to meet again. Then I pulled myself up and turned away, never to agree again. That's a piece. Thank you. Sometimes we all know Normas, isn't that so? You know, and we see Normas and know and in this book, Homegirls and Hand Grenades, I have a piece to Bubba, who was a similar kind of person in that he, was, he dropped out of school early and also fell from a, a sixth floor uh, apartment building trying to break into some, someone's house because he was going to go in there to get some money, uh, uh, not for crack at that time, but for heroin. But you and I understand in no uncertain terms that it's not by chance that crack uh, permeates our society, that people, if they think that you really are dumb and stupid and have no sense at all, they really figure that all you need to do is to get, go and get high on crack. So I went back to see Bubba. Bubba was standing on my corner. I said, I came through and I said, hey Bubba, Hey, lady. How you doing, Sonia? Hey, I heard you went on to Hunter College. This was Bubba, who was our genius. He was the head gang leader where I grew up. And he was in control of everything. Could do anything in a, in a classroom, could do anything outside, too. And he's, you know, and this, this Bubba and I were the king and queen of handball. Do you all play handball in the South? Mm. No, woo! You know, you have a filling station, a wall, and you take a ball and you bounce it up against the wall. Yeah, that's handball. We call it, it uh, you know, and, and that was a mean game in New York City because we played two kinds of games, stick ball with a stick because we couldn't afford the baseball bats. So you, you took a broomstick, right? And you had a ball, you got out in the street and you played uh, stickball. And the other game, which was a serious game, people, you know, was handball. And Bubba and I were called the king and queen of handball. That means we were the toughest thing going, but I didn't mess with Bubba too much because he was also the head gang leader. So I would never challenge him, try to beat him at all, because I knew better, I wasn't crazy, you know. 
Um, but that's a bad game. You hit the ball up against the wall, and you know, the ball bounces, hits the wall, and then hits the ground so low that no one can pick it up. That's when you really are bad, you know, when you can do that. Isn't that, I didn't realize that, you know? But you know, the differences in games around the country is something that people should write about, probably. And the urban gangs are something else, too. Any comments about the Norma piece? Anyone? Yes. Just say it real fast, and I'll repeat it for people. She said, what's your name? Huh? Leslie? Leslie says she thinks anyone can be a Norma, you know? And anyone can be smart if they put their minds to it, you know. Yeah, yeah. But also what's interesting about Norma is that she was a mathematical genius and she was a linguist too, and people wasted that talent, you see. And the point is not to get your talent wasted, not to let your talent be wasted at all. I did a piece, since this is Women's History Month, I did a piece for some of the young sisters who come to my women's studies class at Temple University. I teach at Temple University. And um, I have a lot of young women who come into that classroom, and young men also, too, on the university, on the college level. And I want to read this poem because of that women's studies class. Listen very carefully to it, young sisters. And brothers, listen, too. Song number two, one. I say, all you young girls waiting to live. I say, all you young girls taking your pill. I say, all your sisters tired of standing still. I say, all your sisters thinking you won't, but you will. Don't let them kill you with their stare. Don't let them closet you with no air. Don't let them feed you sex piecemeal. Don't let them offer you any ordeal. I say, step back, sisters. We rising from the dead. I say, step back, Johnnies. We dancing on our heads. I say, step back, man. No more hanging by a thread. I say, step back, world. Can't let it all go unsaid, too. I say, all you young girls molested at 10. I say all you young girls giving it up again and again. I say all you sisters hanging out in every den. I say all you sisters needing your own oxygen. Don't let them trap you with their coke. Don't let them treat you like one fat joke. Don't let them bleed you till you're broke. Don't let them blind you in masculine smoke. I say, step back, sisters. We rising from the dead. I say, step back, Johnnies. We dancing on our heads. I say, step back, man. No more hanging by a thread. I say, step back, world. Can't let it all go unsaid. I say, step back, world. Can't let it all go unsaid. That's a piece that I did for some young people. And a recent poem that I, I did for, for Bill Cosby, we were talking on the phone and Bill said, Bill, Mr. Cosby said to me, he said, you know, Sonia, he said, um, you know, young people have got to get a sense of what it means to have the fire inside, you know, the fire that makes them want to learn and study and be. And we were talking, so he said, you know, uh, Write, write a poem, Sonia, about that. And I said, okay, I will write a poem about that. And this is a poem for Bill Cosby and for the young people. Sometimes I wonder what to say to you now in the soft afternoon air as you hold us all in a single death. I say, where is your fire? I say, where is your fire? You got to find it and pass it on. You got to find it and pass it on from you to me, from me to her, from her to him, from the son to the father, from the brother to the sister, from the daughter to the mother, from the mother to the child. Where is your fire? I say, where is your fire? Can't you smell it coming out of our past? The fire of living, not dying. The fire of loving, not killing. The fire of blackness, not gangster shadows. Where 
is our beautiful fire that gave light to the world, the fire of pyramids, the fire that burned through the holes of slave ships and made us breathe, the fire that made guts into chitlins, the fire that took rhythms and made jazz, the fire of sit-in and marches that made us jump boundaries and barriers, the fire that took street talk and sounds and made righteous Imhotek rats. Where is your fire? the torch of life, full of Nzinga and Nat Turner and Garvey and Du Bois and Fanny Lou Hamer and Martin and Malcolm and Mandela. Sister, come on, sister, brother, 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 sister, brother, come, 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 catch your fire, don't, don't kill, hold your fire, don't, 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 don't kill, learn your fire, don't, don't, don't kill, be the fire, don't, don't, don't kill, catch, catch, catch the fire and burn with eyes that see our souls walking, yeah, 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 singing, yeah, 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 building, mm-hmm, laughing, ha-ha, <laughs> loving, mm, learning, mm-hmm, teaching, 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 being, come, 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 sister, come, 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 sister, come, 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 brother, here, here, here is my hand, catch, 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 catch the fire and live, 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 ask me, adults ask me, they say, when you go talk to young people, do they listen? Because they say all young people do is they like to just, if you come out, you have to dance probably, you know, or shake or sing, you know. And I said, no, no, young people do listen. I mean, I'm talking about adults talking about you. And I always want them to see how you, you do listen because they assume so, some of the worst things about you which means they assume the worst things about me also too. Because they assume that all we do is watch the idiot box, that's television, you know, you know. And we do watch an awful lot of television, you know. We watch the, the, um, the soaps, you know. We watch, the dude walks into the house, his wife is stretched out on the couch, eating chocolates. He says, darling, 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 Ruby, my secretary told me you're pregnant. She says, yes, I am, Dom, but it's not yours. The music goes, doing, da 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 If you're on the phone, she says, girl, I got to get off the phone because this is some getting to the good part, the good stuff. You know what I mean? Mm-mm. She told him, finally. Mm-mm. Look at that. You know what I'm saying? So the dude goes across to the desk, takes out two gold-tipped cigarettes, lights them, hands her one, and says, darling, do you want to talk about it? She says, yes, I do, Don. Remember that weekend you went away with Marsha because you were mad at me? Well, that weekend I went up to see Paul, who was in, in a veteran's hospital. And I went into the hospital room, and he had a broken left foot and a sprained right knee and a broken left thigh bone and a crushed-in chest cavity and a brain concussion. I went to the hospital to see him, and it happened there. Now, if you break down some of that, some of that is some of the most ridiculous stuff you ever want to hear on the planet Earth, but we watch it. Because America says, come on, all y'all out there, young, old, indifferent, don't matter, right? Come on, listen to all this junk about who's sleeping with whom, as if we should care. Because we really do know in your neighborhood who's sleeping with whom. <laughs> Because we wise. You are wise. I know that. You're very, very hip, very wise. You know what's going on in the world. But they said, get involved with the small obscenities. 
of who's sleeping with whom. And that way you don't get involved with what's really going on in the world. That sometimes we're afraid to come outside to go to school because of people with guns. That people got guns, that people got crack, that sometimes we don't live in the best places, whatever. That, those are the real obscenities because America will not give us what we need and desire and want to be upstanding citizens you see, but let you get involved with the little obscenities, so therefore you laugh about who's sleeping with whom, and you have to deal with the realities outside. It's a cover. So this last piece I wanna do is a piece from a new book of mine, and you will have to listen to it. At the end, I do a chant, and I do it in the Twi language, an African language. It's, it's the words are ibe yiye, which means it'll get better because it will get better if we work and organize, right? You know, if we organize ourselves and love ourselves. If you remember nothing else, I say, love yourselves. I had an aunt who grew up with me, used to come to the house, and she had full lips, big lips. When my sister and I opened the door for her, she'd go, hello, Sonia, hold her lips in. Hello, Sonia. And my sister and I said, well, how you doing? How you feel, auntie? How you doing? Holding the laughter in. We take her inside the house and go into our bedroom, fall across the bed and go, hello, Pat. How you doing, Pat? How you doing, Sonia? We were laughing at her. That same aunt dying of cancer in a place called Detroit, Michigan, when I went to see her and I opened the door and cancer had wiped out all fatness on her face and her body, all over her body, and her lips were no longer full. But when she saw me, she pulled herself up with her last breath, and she went, hello, Sonia. And I started to cry, not because she was dying. At the moment of birth, we all began our long or short walk towards death. No, no, no. I cried because she lived all her life, and she was looking at death, still not liking her lips. Come on, come on. These lips are full and they're beautiful. When you kiss somebody, they know they've been kissed. <laughs> hmm. This nose spreads out. My father spent half his life doing this to my nose and it's still plopped back, you know? I mean, I pass by him, he go, you know, I used to go around him so he wouldn't do that, right? But this nose that spreads, and, and not all of us have wide noses. You know, we, we have some of us have thin noses, whatever. But if you have the wide nose, people, in the summertime, you breathe better than other people, honestly. <laughs> yes, you do. And all that heavy humidity, you really do. That's why it's there, you know? And this hair that defies, I mean, I don't care what we do to the hair, sisters. You know, it always jumps back into eyes here. You know what I mean? I don't care what, what chemical we put on it. You know what I mean? It jumps back into eyes here, still here, waiting for you. Okay. <laughs> but it's this love of self, people. You got to know finally on this earth, when you love yourself, you have no reason to hate anybody else. Believe me, when you love yourself, you don't hate other people. <laughs> Honestly, believe me. It is because you have this great love for self, you don't need to exploit people. You don't need to hit people, you see. But you gotta love this self. It's the only self you got. Love what it means to be blackly black, blueberry black, you know what I mean? That kind of black, to like pecan brown, to high yellow, and then don't hate someone because a person is high yellow and because you blueberry black, huh? Huh? You know, talk about you think you cute. Maybe she is cute. Huh? Maybe you're cute too. You know, talk about you got that kind of hair. It's curly, you think you're cute. Well, she can't help it she got curly hair. She was born with it. Come on, lay off, whatever. But your hair is just as beautiful. If you would ever touch the strength of black hair, come on, but I wasn't joking when I said whatever you do to that hair, you jump in water, it jumps out at you and say, here I is. You know, it really does. It is there, it's some strong stuff. <laughs> And moving to the 21st century, we gotta come to some conclusion about hair, noses, mouths, skin. We cannot go to the 21st century people going in there not liking ourselves, okay? 
So if you remember nothing else I say, you've got to remember, I like me. Remember the song, you won't remember, but if you go back and, and, and listen to some James Brown songs, he said a song some years ago, good God, I'm gonna jump back and kiss myself. Mm. What we need to do is get up in the morning and jump back and kiss ourselves. Mm. <coughs> Sonia, look at you. Mm -mm. Look at you. Mm. You need to say it. And then walk around each day. Because the joy for many of us in our time, I don't know if any of you all saw that uh, documentary, uh, Make It Plain, Malcolm. What I was trying to say on that documentary is that the thing that Malcolm gave us is that he made us finally love ourselves. And the moment of loving ourselves, we became human. You hear that? The moment you truly love yourselves, you become human. And then you can deal on the earth, you know, walk upright. You go into, into meetings with people as an equal. You say, well, here I am. I'm ready to deal in this meeting as an equal. Not like, oh, here I am at the meeting. You go into classrooms. So wh what's going to happen today in this classroom? Hmm? What you going to teach me today? I'm here. I'm not sleeping because I sat up watching, you know, Arsenio last night and I can't deal in the morning, huh? Hmm? No, I'm in here because you better teach me. I need to know. I need to know how to negotiate the earth, the world, the country. Huh? See, so when you love yourself, you go in the classroom and says, I'm here to learn. Get down in your seat. Okay, what's on the menu today? What you gonna teach me today? And you do that with dignity, people. Yeah, you do. It's something you gotta remember, you know. So jump up in the morning sometimes, although your breath might be still bad in the morning when you look in the mirror, you know. But jump up and say, mm, look at here, Charlene, Shaniqua, ooh, LaTanya, ooh, LaVon, look at me. Mm. Shaquille, mm, look at here, gonna kiss myself this morning and go out and negotiate the world. You gotta do it, yeah. I'm gonna have to read back here. I hate always standing still, as you probably can tell. But this, um, I can't turn these pages in this book without um, being here, I'm gonna call on some of your living and ago past ancestors. You might recognize some of the names, but I want you to really listen, get a little closer to you, hate being far away. You might recognize some of them. Chris Harney, Oliver Tambo, Shavaz, Ella Baker, Odetta, C.L.R. James, W.B. Du Bois, Nzinga, Shea, John Brown, Sojourner Truth, Sitting Bull, Maurice Bishop, Betty Shabazz, Sister Lebron, Tony Morrison, the Honorable Marcus Garvey, Ida Wells, Barnett, Fidel, Harriet Tubman, Paul Robeson, Sandino, Fanny Lou Hamer, Nelson Mandela, Winnie Mandela, Geronimo, MLK, Jose Marti, David Walker, Margaret Walker, Alice Walker, Shirley Graham Du Bois, Martin Delaney, Herman Ferguson, Septima Clark, Lumumba, Queen Mother Moore, Nkrumah, Black Sash Society, Gwendolyn Brooks, Dodd and Mama Susulu, Sterling Brown, Dorothy Day, Elizabeth Catlett, Angela Davis, Maya Angelou, Tony K. Bambara, June Jordan, Mr. Michaud, Audrey Lord, Malcolm, Malcolm, Malcolm. We are here because while some countries pay lip service to an anti-apartheid policy, they continue to invest in an apartheid economy on the racist in defiance of UN resolutions to the contrary. We are here to celebrate the 65th birthday of MLK, the 68th birthday of Malcolm. We are here because we have been retaught the nature of those in power who would say there are no hungry people or children in America. One who will continue to tell offensive ethnic jokes. One who would say sanctions against South Africa would deprive women of their lust for jewelry. One who would watch the rising unemployment of black youth with little comment 
but would comment in a loud TV voice about the prostitution of young blacks, Latinos, whites, on the Times Squares of the world as the suburban fathers stepped right up for their pick of black Puerto Rican black youth. Step right up, I say, step right up. A good sale on black and brown and white meat today. Young and tender bucks right here for your bourgeois dreams. Going gone, gone, sold to the highest bidder, Long Island businessman or congressman, waiting in the eastern pass of lust or college president, stripping our youth literally of their dignity or circling the backs of black Puerto Rican white unemployment. We are here because Puerto Rico was used as a staging ground for the invasion of Grenada. We are here to remember the invasion of Grenada done under the guise of restoring peace. We are here because of the continued displacement of Native Americans. We are here because Africans, Latinos, Native Americans, Asians are starving and dying in Somalia, Uganda, El Salvador, Ethiopia, Cameroons, Mississippi, Nicaragua, Harlem, on reservations, refugees all. We are here because every three days, 120,000 children die of starvation or the effects of starvation. We are here because of the children of Atlanta, the children and adults of MOVE, the rise of racism on college campuses, the detention of young brothers and sisters in South Africa, the killing of children in El Salvador. Listen to their cries, my brothers and sisters. Ah, 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 ah. Dada, Dada, I am here in this detention center and they are hurting me. They have put things on my private parts and Dada, I am only, I am only 10 years old. I am only 11 years old. I am only 12 years old. And I was just marching against apartheid and Dada, Dada, Baba, Daddy, Dada, Dada, they are coming into the room again, the soldiers, and they are laughing, and Dada, they are coming towards me, and Dada, I don't want to die, Dada, I don't want to die, Dada, 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 Mama Sita, Mama Sita, Mama Sita, Mama Sita, I, I am, I am stretched out on the ground, and Mama Sita, Mama Sita, the soldiers, the soldiers, Mama Sita, I think may be in so, I think may be in so, I think it is the 15th one who is entering me, and my blood, my blood spills on the ground, and Mama, 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 Mama Sita, Mama Sita, I am only, I am only nine years old, I am only ten years old, I am only eleven years old, and Mama Sita, the soldiers. The soldiers are looking and eating and dancing and talking and pointing and watching and waiting and Mama Sita, Mama Sita, maybe and so I think I think maybe and so I think it is the thirty-fifth one who is entering me and my blood spills on the ground and I don't want to die, 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 die Mama Sita, Daddy, Daddy. Daddy, I'm in the basement. Daddy, 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 I'm in the basement with Mama in Philadelphia. Daddy, 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 the, the fire, the fire is coming towards us. Daddy, daddy, the police are firing on us and we can't get out of the building. And daddy, 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 the fire, the fire is burning, burning Mama's hair and it's burning Mama's skin. And daddy was stooped down low behind Mama. And, and, and daddy, 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 the fire is coming towards me and it's burning my hair. And I can't get out, and I'm only five years old. I'm only seven years old. I'm only eight years old. I'm only nine years old. I'm only 11 years old. And Philadelphia, don't let us And we've got to turn the cries of our children into bright green laughter. We have got to finally, in our time, this time, come together and organize. So come on, blood. Come on, African American. Come on, walk upright and organize. You can do it. Come on, Latinos. Organize and you're not, you can do it. Come on. Come on. Come on, whites. Drop the privilege.
churches and organize, you can do it. Come on, Asians, organize. Come on, Native Americans, organize, you can do it. Yes, you can, yes, you can, yes, you can. Latinos, organize, you can do it, yes. Come on, gays, organize. Come on, lesbians, organize. Come on, Jews, Muslims, organize. And you're not, you can do it because in our time, if we organize and walk upright like human beings, it will get better. In three words, eBay, yay, yay. eBay, eBay, yay, 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 yay,
Yes. So I want to say I really appreciate it. Thank you. The, the librarians used to tell me that the problem with my books is that they, I got these complaints that people would take the books and not bring them back. Right. I want to ask, well, in America right now, the number one topic on everyone's minds is violence and violence and violence. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the blame is starting to be put, kind of put on hip hop music or rap music. Mm -hmm. and I want to know what are your views or what do you think about rap music as mm -hmm. it developed through the 70s and it is today in 1994? Right. That was one of the things that I, that I tried to respond to with that piece for, for Cosby. Did you hear it? Yeah. Right. But also, yeah, um, you, you and I understand that one of the things that young black men and women did in this country is that they came up with something called rap. And you think about the genius of that, but again, that was not new. Uh, that rap came out of the poetry of, of people coming out of the 60s, right? Because if you go back and read some of the poetry that we did, a lot of the poetry, we got up on stage and we did it very fast. You know what I'm saying? da 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 you did, you know. So that was what we did, you know. So we understood that that was a tradition that was being continued. And we applauded the young people who were doing that. What was exciting about that is that no one wanted to touch it. None of the, uh, the even the black publish, you know, movie, um, uh, publishing companies and music companies said that will never last. But these young people had an underground, and there's an underground in America that is amazing. They would sell those tapes to each other, and it would go from the East Coast to the West Coast, and all of a sudden, that, that people began to make money on that. And the powers that be said, how can you make money in America, and I'm not a part of it. It's true. And they said, they went and dipped. They said, I want this group and that group, and that group. You come under my contract, right? I will give you so much money, whatever, et cetera, but I also will get a part of that, because before, they weren't getting a part of that. And so young people were brought into what we call this so-called mainstream, you know, contracts or whatever. And then you saw people also, since it's gonna make money, they bring up their own groups. I mean, America will rec recreate and create people, right? They created groups, brought them up, and, but it had no, no, no social conscious mes message quite often. And it, you got the music that began to demean and laugh and talk about people, and even stuff talk about, yeah, I'm walking down the street with my gun, you know what I mean, and I'm gonna go da 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 do whatever, you know, well, come on. First of all, there's nothing new about black folks with guns. If you, I was raised in the South, and I, you and I know that black folks and white folks and green folks in the South always have had guns in their homes, you know? And they didn't go around killing people with them. You know, it's just one of the things that people did. But what is going on now is that, you see, America is a violent society. It's been violent for the moment people came on this, on this earth here in the Western Hemisphere. You know what I'm saying? The violence that was done against African Americans here is unbelievable, is it not? The violence violence that's been done in wars coming out of Europe. I mean, think about the wars, that all the wars that have come and they're doing our country, huh? In the 19th century, think about the wars in Europe. You talk about violent people, huh? You talk about dropping bombs on a country, dropping bombs on, on people in a place called uh, Philadelphia. You talk about in Tulsa, Oklahoma in the 1920s, when black men and women became millionaires in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and people got upset about that. And so therefore someone said, maybe someone hurt somebody, you know, and there was a big disturbance. And there was this big, big and close riot in a place called Tulsa, Oklahoma in the 19, early 1920s. And they dropped dynamite on the city and wiped out 75 people, mostly African Americans, and they put black folks in concentration camps there. That's violence, you know. But talk about the subtle violence. The violence of when I was coming up, going to school, never seeing me in a classroom. So I go to school and someone said to me, well, what about black folks? What do they do? And what did I say? Nothing. Can you imagine going to school to learn and you think your people have never done anything? How can you learn? Huh? How do you learn badly? How do you learn not at all? How do you learn, well, I don't care? How do you learn, you know? You learn in a way, well, I'm inferior, but I'll learn it anyway. I'll be what I call the exceptional blood. And so they have the violence that is already here, the violence in America that they ask us, you know, to build our houses on land that's polluted, huh? The violence that is done to young people by getting them exposed always to the violence of sex, to the violence, you know, of not even being able to get a good education, to the violence of not good food, to the violence, the violence of 
being 18 years of age, going off to fight a war in Korea and Vietnam, you know, whatever. That's violence. And you tell me about the violence that young people are dealing with? Huh? Huh? I'll tell you about America was raised. America was created on violence, period. And so what we want to say to people, that's why people are saying now, well, let's come up against the young brothers and sisters and, and, and let's boycott their records. I say, no, 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 no. These are people who have, in a sense, invented themselves. Now you want to slap them down? Huh? What did you do for them? Did you keep the idea of Malcolm or Garvey alive until these young people started doing it in the 1970s? I remember when I heard a tape that one of my, my twins brought in the house, I laughed. I said, this is bad. Whatever. Because I knew what they were doing. And I understood why they were doing. In the midst of all the silence of some people were saying, I've made it. I've arrived. I don't have to talk that black stuff anymore. That's in the past. I'm uh, an executive. I uh, walk, I, I walk an, a walk that says, I don't, what are you all talking about? Uh, you don't talk proper English. Uh, uh, what do you mean y'all and, 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 it, and it be and you be, huh? Um, no, no, you see? And all of a sudden that came back and you understood that. So yes, I support, but I have dialogues with brothers and sisters and I say to them, you have no right to get up and demean women the way you do in a song. Cause that's your mama, that's your grandmama. That's your sister, huh? <laughs> but you know what one of the brothers said? You gotta hear this, young sister. Listen, young sister. You know what the brother said? He said, we wrote it. We just didn't expect any woman would get up and perform it. I said, what do you mean? Say it again. Well, you know, it's coming out of my head. I wrote it, but I figured we couldn't find anyone to pay anyone who get up and do what we said do. <sighs> and I said, when you truly love yourself, no amount of money of $50 or having one minute on TV will make you get up and demean yourselves, right? <laughs> Hear it. Hear it. And then I came back and said to the brother, yeah, but you know, everybody wants to be on TV. <laughs> you know, so therefore maybe we don't need to create some of those lyrics, right? That do demean people. But then there's another real kind of thing happening here. That some of us think it's really nice, you know, to be like, you know, gangsters. You know, they have the, the mentalities of people getting down like, you know, like, I'm a gangster. You know, I said, blood, no, you ain't. You know what I mean? You ain't no gangster. You live on, you know, Riverside Drive. You know, you've never been a gangster in your life. You know what I'm saying? But they, because it's hip. You know, it's hip, you know, like to, to be like, I'm bad, you know, whatever. But there is in this country, and the young men don't understand what they're doing, and the young women. You see, if you can show that like all the young men are angry and have gangster mentalities, it's very easy to wipe them out eventually. And I say to Todd, the young, it is, it really is, people. So you're playing into, you're playing into some crazy stuff. You see, because you see, in spite of everything, if you believe, begin to believe that and act that out, you'll end up in jail and your music will die and they'll bring someone to replace you doing similar kinds of things, you see. So yes, I think we need a dialogue to sit down with young brothers and sisters saying, look, this is what, this is what, this, you think if the record company says to you, you got to do this, then we need the people, the, entre the black entrepreneurs, you know what I'm saying? Bl the, black, the black millionaires and billionaires, you know, who will come into this record business and say, look, we'll, we'll pay you for doing the right kind of records. We will pay you to do these, and we will also distribute those records around the country to every church, every community, every school we can get it to. M let them, let those brothers and sisters continue to make money, you see, and they will do the right thing. Make no mistake about it. But we need that dialogue, not slamming them and getting mad at them and calling them all kinds of names, right? But a dialogue always. Because these are, are, these are young, young creative geniuses doing this work, you see. And they, uh, they feel like they're under attack, right? And so they're going to respond and come back with some harder stuff, you see. Yeah, it's true. I know. Okay? Thank you, brother. Mm -hmm. How you doing? How you doing? How you doing? What's your name? Okay, glad to meet you, brother. Mahaka Khan. That's that's very nice. Mm. Unfortunately, I haven't been too familiar with your work. That's all right, brother. Uh, brother Oh yeah. 
still, right. Well, you know, I, we started black studies in America at a place called San Francisco State in 1967. In San Francisco, brother, and going, and going out there, the, um, one of the most important organizations out there was the Black Panther Party at the time. Uh, Huey, uh, Bobby Seale, um, um, and uh, what's his name came out later on when he got out of prison? Elders Cleaver. A man I never, never, never liked, okay? And I'll tell you why. And Kathleen Cleaver, his wife. Because you see, I don't care what movement you're into. Listen to this, brothers and sisters. And I mean all of you, brothers and sisters. You hear that? Okay? All of you sitting there. I don't care what organization you're in, when someone violates something that you know is wrong, of principle or value, you don't follow it. You have to say, no, no, I object to that. Cleaver wrote a book called Soul and Ice. And in that book, he talked about raping black women to practice raping black women so he could go and rape white women properly. There is no proper way to rape any kind of woman, right? So when they, I was, that's true. So when I was asked to review that book, for a, 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 mag, a, a, a magazine called Negro Digest, or Black World at the time. A very uh, dear friend of mine, I mean of all of us, was, was, uh, was the editor of it. I, my first line of review, it says, Elders Cleaver is not a revolutionary. Any man who rapes women, right, I don't care what color, is not a revolutionary, period. They did not run that review. They said to me, sister, you don't understand the movement. I said, yes, I do but I understand something deeper than that. I understand what the sisters told me, what my mama told me, what my grandmother told me, right? what my daddy told me, that he's violating a principle that I know is correct. You do not do damage to people and then call it revolution. Okay? You see, that's what's real. So you always gotta remember the values that people taught you. And I don't care how hip some of these things. So yes, I mean, we were there, um, part of uh, the black, I, I wrote poems for, for, for their newspaper, the Black Panther uh, newspaper, which was, which was um, a pattern on, on, on Muhammad Speaks newspaper, by the way. Um, uh, the brother, my first book, Homecoming, there's this picture of this, this young girl, you know, in, a, in dress, whatever. Uh, Emery, who was um, Panther Party, um, cultural minister did the cover. So the Black Panther Party was a very important party initially in that it protected that's why they were established, okay. And one of the pro projects we did when I first went out there is that we were giving, uh, having Saturday programs with the Black Panther Party for children, feeding them, giving them breakfast, and also uh, doing an educational program for them on Saturdays because they, the, they weren't getting the education um, but you know, a lot of things happen. And one of the things that happened there is that some sisters came to me at San Francisco after Cleaver got out, and there were some real strange things going on. For instance, the brother started saying to the sisters, the only way you can contribute to the Black Panther Party is on your back, you know. And there was something wrong with that, you know, if you understand what I'm saying. So some of the women s invited me to a, now it wasn't a luncheon, I'll never forget the woman's house, and all these young sisters wanted to join the Black Panther Party, right? And they, they asked me, sister, we don't know really what you're about, and we don't believe in black studies, and we don't believe in that black thing, and we don't believe in all that, but we believe in our daughters, and we believe that you're human. Can you talk to our daughters? And I told them, don't join the Black Panther Party. Not at the stage it's at right now, okay? Because I said, all you would do is get hurt, and you'll be then against against black folks as a consequence, okay? Because when anyone tells you that your only position is position on your backside, okay? Then you know that that organization does not mean you any, any good. But there was a lot of good people in the Black Panther Party, my brother. A lot of good young brothers in there, you know, who knew what they were about, you know, who were honest, okay, who were sincere. There were a lot of young sisters in there who were sincere, but I also saw some of them get bitter and leave, okay, never to look back and do anything with black folks again in their lives, you see. What we were trying to do is say, don't do that, and then, then give up on black folks, period. But there was a lot of good things that happened with Black Panther Party. It's most especially, it, it stirred the imagination of young black men. 
It kept them from saying, I ain't got anything to like, I feel good about myself. You know what I'm saying? They walked upright, you know, and they did some good things um, from that breakfast program, okay, to the protection of the, they, they would walk people home from buses at night because the police in Oakland used to beat up people, yes. Well, you know, that was a very interesting thing about Elaine Brown. They did a lot of good things with Elaine Brown. That's right, you know. And I'm not, I'm not saying one was better than the other, but she assumed the leadership there when, when, when other people weren't able to do that. So a lot of good things happened. The, at the beginning, some people said the best thing was when they were doing the patrolling there in Oakland. I mean, for the first time, black, they protected the black community. You know what I'm saying? They protected the black community because black folks were getting beat up. When they got off, they were getting beat up. And, and these men came out in black jackets, you know what I'm saying, leather jackets, and said, you can't do that anymore. And for the first time, we saw the idea of people should be, how they should protect the community, right? And Elaine did a lot of good work. Yes, she did. So that breakfast program was important, but also they, they, they did the educational thing also, too, in conjunction with the Black Student Union. Because when we were at, at, at San Francisco State, the Panther Party was over with us, doing programs, and we were over in the park until Cleaver got out and said he could not be involved anymore with uh, what he called ca cultural nationalists. And then from that on, point on, a lot of stuff happened. But the point is that, the point to you is how do you, what do you do with that, brother? How do you learn from that kind of division? How do you learn from that kind of energy? How do we learn at some point that any time you have an organization there's gonna be dissension, and how do you then have a dialogue and make sure that dissension doesn't destroy uh, an organization or a party, you know. But study those people critically. They're not gods. Nobody were gods, okay? So study it critically and then take from it that which was good and discard that which was incorrect. Thank you. Yes. I can't hear you, sister. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. What influenced me to become a poet? That's a nice question. Thank you. All the questions are just superb. I was, remember in the piece I did for Norma, I stuttered? Well, my, my grand, when, my, when I was one year old, my mother died giving birth to twins. And so my grandmother came to my father's house and picked me and my sister up and took me, took my sister, you know, took me and my sister to her house and raised us uh, for the next six years. When my grandmother died, I began a long process of stuttering, which was all about, I guess, mourning her, in a sense, right? So I stuttered. But because no one wanted to listen to me, I began to write these little things down on paper. And someone saw it once and said, oh, look at that. Look at that. Sonia's uh, uh, writing this poem, because I had like these little rhymes and stuff, right? So when I was six, seven, I started to write these little poems, because I was communicating with myself and with other people also. I wouldn't talk, because they would just say, oh, girl, why don't you talk right? Huh? Oh, God, you know, I know what people will do. I mean, they just will not. Even I know when I was doing the stuttering, I heard some of you laughing. People will laugh at you, which makes it worse for you as a stutterer, you know? Um, so that's how I began to write. And some of the people who influenced me, I mean, I wrote throughout, when we moved to New York, I continued to write in junior high school and, and high school and, uh, and in college. Um, I had this professor in college, because um, I went into a class, I said, well, I want to really learn how to write. So I took this class, and the professor said, well, I want you to write, a, 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 t choose one of your parents, and write something about your parent, that, your, your parent, your mother, father, that was different, how the person changed. So I did this piece about my father, who was a very quiet, gentle man, who was uh, a man who was raised in the South. So when he came home this day, he came in and slammed the door and said simply, um, he was, had been on an elevator and a white man had patted him on the head and he was furious about it. But he came home and my father was not a cursor, so he cursed. So he came in, he was cursing, which is unusual for my father. So I wrote this piece about this man, this gentle man who came inside one, one night and cursed and it disrupted the whole family. We kind of looked up. We knew something was wrong. He told us. So I gave this to my professor, and he gave it back to me, you know, the next day or two days later with a C plus saying, I don't quite understand this. I don't know why anyone would get mad because someone patted him on the head. 
I said, oops, it was all in red. I said, oops, there's a problem here, but I went on. Then he said, give us another example of a parent. Blah, blah. So I give an example of my stepmother, who was a southern black woman who uh, never would go downtown to shop, but she only shopped at 125th Street because she was, a, she was frightened to go downtown amongst a lot of white folks and, you know, and the big stores, whatever. So she went to 125th Street. For those of you who don't know New York City, 125th Street was an area for... Uh, uh, with, with stores for black folks, which meant we got seconds, not proper, not good clothing, but seconds. But she felt okay because there were black folks there. Hear what I'm saying? So this day she couldn't get what she wanted, so my sister and I said, come on, Jerry, we'll take you downtown to Macy's, not to Lord and Taylor, not to Saks Fifth Avenue, not to the, the, the expensive stores, but Macy's, which was like a store for everybody. But she didn't like going downtown or going on the train, so we took her down there. And so in the piece, I say all oh, this about her nervousness and being scared and afraid because the underlying thing, theme, and there was fear, fear of New York City, fear of whites, etc. We got downtown. She got her thing, my sister and I standing there, and she waits for this woman to recognize her. And she waits, and she waits, and she waits. And I kept saying, Jerry, Jerry, give her this, go on, get it. And the woman finally saw her waiting and ignored her, went around, got everybody else, and finally, after about 40 minutes later, she says, what do you want, huh? And Jerry gave it to her, but she was, when she handed her hand, was shaking. And as a child, I didn't understand that fear. You gotta hear this. But I would and I wrote about it. The guy gave me back the, um, the piece, C+. Plus. I don't understand anyone in New York City being afraid of going, down, they're going downtown just to, to buy something. I don't understand this at all. Well, I realized, then he said to me at a conference, why don't you write more creative things? So I said, I'm going to end up with a C in this class. You know, some of you know what I mean? So there is a problem here. It's not on me, but I knew at that time. So he said, why don't you write more imaginative things? So I went home, sitting in my bedroom. We had this long dresser mirror there. I said, I'll give this sucker something, you know? So I pretended, I wrote this piece about I'm sitting in my bedroom and some figure comes out the, out the mirror and begins to talk to me and black, pure crap. I gave this thing to this guy. He says, A minus, this is what I mean. You know, this is really creative and blah, 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 blah. But it's talked about nothing. So the rest of the semester, I talked about dogs talking to me. <laughs> but I stopped writing. After that class, I didn't write again. Because he, what he had done to me is that he had really violated me because he didn't understand what I was writing, you see. Uh, and it took me a couple years to get back to writing. So those of you who might want to write, make sure that the people you study with, okay, really will not violate who you are. Hear what I'm saying? And can empathize. If you think that's not the case, drop out if you can. Jump back if you can, okay? And get to a, a teacher or a professor who will truly let you write what you're feeling in a classroom. And that's what I wrote at that time. Then I went to... Um, when I got out of Hunter, I went to NYU, and I studied with a woman by the name of Louise Bogan. And I went into her classroom in grad school. I sat by the door, because I said, I might have to leave here fast, you know? And she, <laughs> she let me write what I wanted to write, and I stayed for a year and studied uh, with her. And if you are a writer, I suggest you write every day. If you have a journal, write in that journal every day. Whatever I did last night, I was so tired. But I keep a notebook with me in my briefcase, and I got in bed, went to sleep, fell asleep on the news, right? I was whipped because I've been traveling a great deal. But at 3 o'clock when I got up to put my pajamas on, right, I pulled out my notebook against my will to write what I was thinking, some thoughts I was thinking that day. Because I have to keep the continuity going, the writing going, the continuity going, going. But also study with people. Learn form. Learn what it is sometimes, what a villanelle is. Learn what a hakut, a tanka is, okay? It stretches the mind, okay? Not that you have to write them forever, okay? Okay? Understand the free verse, something called ver libre, free verse is really, does have form, whatever. And when you find out that kind of discipline, you find out a lot about yourself also, too, that your body also has form and must be disciplined also, too. Okay? Thank you, sister.
mm-hmm. poetic society, Thank you. Mm-hmm. First of all, I'd like to say that um, we give thanks to having you, Mother mm-hmm. Sister, mm-hmm. in the city, mm-hmm. you know, your world travels, mm-hmm. and things that if you, you know, walk with them. Mm-hmm. Um, I would like to ask a two-part question. Um, I know in your poetry there's a lot of active and social consciousness mm-hmm. and things that the, uh, that the world should know about the other worlds that they do not know about. Mm-hmm. So what do you think about uh, the poets such as the last poets, the original last poets, the Watch Prophets, mm-hmm. and Amiri Baraka, and, and so on. But they still they do the same thing. Mm-hmm. We all come from the same period, and we were doing the same thing. Um, uh, Baraka, Larry Neal, all all of us, we came up together. We were all the same people doing the same kind of poetry. Uh, some of the differences that might have existed as a female poet. Um, I, I would bring up issues that sometimes the men wouldn't bring up, and sometimes I got in trouble. Um, but I was on purpose, because I had to get in trouble on that. Because you see, in a movement that talked about suppressing, oppressing women, I had to say something. Because remember, I was, I was on the stage, I was about the only woman poet up there at the beginning on the stage with men. So when I got ready to read sometimes, people would leave. And one day I finally said, but hold it. What I'm saying is just as important. And sometimes that can get you in trouble because I was supposed to not say anything. But the point is that, brother, our history as African people, those sisters who started universities and colleges in America, they didn't get back and step back, you know. Those mothers who washed and ironed and sent us to these colleges and universities, they didn't step back, okay? And these women and men who came out and brought us out of our enslavement period, you know, they didn't step back, you know, who traveled. I mean, you think about Ida Wells Barnett, you know, that woman walked down the street with pistols, pistols on us. I mean, that was a bad woman, you know. I mean, she was bad. She walked down them Tennessee streets, you know, and said that was a tough woman. And they didn't mess with her until she was out of, out of the city. I'm just saying we have that kind of history. And what we must not let anyone come with any kind of philosophy that would make us not understand and deal with each other, you know, in a good fashion, putting one over the other. Because that's not been our history as Af- Af- African people in this country. Angela Davis says that she not, and this is not verbatim, that the thing about our enslavement period, the thing about slavery, is that it made equals of men and women. Because women were out there doing the same work the men were doing. So women would could never be, if, you know, this like, I'm a little, 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 you know, like, oh, oh, oh gosh, 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 you know? Because we're out there pulling like everybody else and picking like everybody else, you see. So I'm just saying, going to the 21st century, you as poets, your poems and your writings, you know, must not imitate the bad that some people did. Stay with me. But you've got to examine what people said and then take from it only that which will make us move wisely as men and women in the 21st century. Okay? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The second point is that uh, just with New Orleans and our dialect, uh, I don't know if you Speaking, mm-hmm. Pastor, you know, right. Africana, mm-hmm. uh, lingo. But how can you uh, give us, the children, in, uh, different words for us to express our ways? Because a lot of times we are, we are put down about our dialect and just mm-hmm. dealing with the New Orleans public school system about standard English, right. uh, correct English, and right. here's our dialect. You do have a beautiful dialect. Oh, yes. This yeah. may be the last uh, mm. American city with African culture. Mm. Part of our dialect is a representation of that. So what would you say to the children? Well, I think that, you know, the point is that there's nothing wrong with writing it and speaking it. You know, also at the same time, you've got to go out and, 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 and navigate and negotiate a larger world. So what we used to do in New York City is that, you know, we always spoke what they call black English. I call it black English. At home and amongst ourselves, when we got up in a classroom and the teacher demanded something else, we responded. But it didn't mean we didn't do what we wanted to do when we got amongst ourselves, right? That's what we did, you see. One of the things that we attempted to do with our poetry, if you really read us carefully, starting with homecoming, 
is that we use what they call black dialect. And people, the reason why we were attacked is because we did that. Don't you understand why we were attacked? We were attacked not because necessarily what we were saying, we challenged the world, but they kept saying, this is not poetry. That's why I understand and empathize with the rappers. I know what people are saying, because we experience the same thing. This is not poetry. Um, poetry does not speak in this fashion. Um, it does not uh, use curse words. Uh, it does not uh, do all that stuff. We were attacked from the New York Times on, you see. And we, but we persisted. And one of the things that we did is that I saw in my time courses called Black English come up, you see. But it took time. And I would say to young people, it is possible to write a poem, you know, and I've seen people do this, you know, in, right? In quotes, and I'm not too sure I like the word lingo, but in, you know, in your own patois or your own language, and then do it in the so-called English version, and then go back and end it with the patois. It's beautiful. I mean, I've, I've been in New Orleans a lot, and I've heard some of the poets who would say, come read with me, and they've done it. It's beautiful. And what you do is you remind people, it will not die out, it is still there, we still carry it in our genes, oh yes we do, it is still there, whatever you see. And that's what that's all about. And we give praise to you for wanting to write poetry. We give praise to you for being poets. It is not an easy thing to do. We give praise to the artists. It is not easy being an artist on this earth, but we need you. It is, I won't say what I want to say because the young people here, we're on tape. It is, you know what kind of world it is. It is mm, up. Yes, it is. Okay. Yes, it is. And without the artists who say, I refuse to let you F it up a whole lot, okay, any more than you've done, I will make people stay human in spite of this inhumanity. That's why we need you. So continue to be. If I can help you in any way, please let me know. Mm -hmm. How are you? Hello, how are you? I wanted to know how your style changed, if it changed at all, when you met Malcolm X. Ah, yes, that's a very good question. Well, I know, as I said, I wrote poetry, and I would write poems. Um, I'm basically a lyrical poet. If you really hear some of the things that I read, that I write, that I don't always get a chance to read. When I met Malcolm, I guess I say it the same way. We had, he had come on the scene in America, and we, I was in something called New York Corps, the Congress of Racial Equality, and we thought we were the baddest thing going in New York, because we really were. We closed down anything that should be closed down if they didn't do what they said they were going to do, and we picketed everything and whatever. My father tells the story about me at 135th Street, where a place called Harlem Hospital is, and they were going to build, uh, Harlem Hospital was, I mean, a hospital that, um, that was just too small for all the people who came there to get, to get uh, cured or whatever. So they decided to build an extension. But one of the things we were pushing as, as core members is that we were, were opening up the unions, the electricians union, the plumbers union, all those unions to black and Puerto Ricans, right? And the union said, we're not going to do it. So we said, but you're not going to build then an extension to Harlem Hospital, you know, without black and Puerto Ricans. So we put a picket line around Harlem when they got ready to build, which meant the men couldn't get in. I mean, and, and literally, we, we got truncated. We were like this. Well, when you do that, when you come up against money and stuff and building whatever, people get very serious. They sent the police on horseback. to come and move us. And my father, who lives right there on 35th Street, had his binoculars from the 17th floor looking down, and he saw me right there in front and screamed. Because here were the pol police coming on horseback, right? Mm -mm. And we're like this. We will not be moved, whatever. Madness on some levels, OK? And the police coming. My father, he ran to the elevator, 17 floors, you gotta come down and stuff right ever. And we're there, and the police coming. The thing that saved us is that a police, black police captain has been driven to work this morning and saw the, the scene and drove, had the driver drive his car up and stop it. We were gonna be killed probably because we knew what we were doing. We felt this is right, this is good, this is justice, whatever, et cetera, right? And then we started negotiations there 
criticism of us is that they asked us then, well, do you have any people <laughs> to go into the union? We didn't have anybody. <laughs> we hadn't even got names yet. So we had to go around finding people. So always when you're doing something, you should be organized and think you're going to win and you're going to have some names, right? We found the names. My brother included went into that union. So therefore, when we organized in Harlem as core members, once Malcolm sent a letter to us, a note saying, you cannot have any more organizations, uh, organizational meetings and meetings with the public, with the uh, community, unless I'm invited. We said, God, what's his problem? He's racist, you know. America told us he was racist, right? Racist, you know. Huh. We were mad. But you couldn't have a demonstration in Harlem without Malcolm. Malcolm was Harlem, if you understand that. So sure enough, he came. Every time he came, everyone left. This day, it was a rainy, rainy day. And in Harlem, when it's rainy and cloudy, as dirty as the buildings are in Harlem, when it's cloudy and rainy, you can see the colors, the reds and yellows of the buildings. When it's cloudy, you know what I mean? And I was standing there on the aisle on, the, on 7th Avenue, standing there in the rain, just a slight, slight, slight rain. Mr. Bichot's store was across the way, bookstore was across the way. Mr. Bichot had a bookstore originally uh, on 7th Avenue and 125th Street, and was later was moved to Lenox and 125th Street. And we were in front of the Harlem, um, not the Harlem Hotel, T Teresa Hotel, Hotel Teresa, which is no longer there. The Teresa Hotel was, 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 was almost torn down when Fidel came and stayed there. Got to understand connections, people. And Malcolm came and spoke, and all my cohorts said, I'm going back to the office. My office was 125th Street. I ain't going to hear this racist, you know. But I stood there that day looking at the rain, looking at the building, saying, look at here, red and yellows, you know. I looked up at Malcolm and said, look at the red and yellows on him, right? Mm and just stood there. You know how sometimes you're in the house and the sun comes in and you rush to pull down the shade, but before you pull down the shade, the sun seeps in anyway and warms you? Oh, and I, <laughs> I walked up to him and said to him, you know, I didn't quite agree with what you, all that you said, but you know, uh, some of the stuff was okay and blah, 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 blah. He said, looked at me with those eyes that could penetrate to the heart. And he said, one day you will, my sister. And I remember I went back to the office, and I started to talk. As you know, Malcolm said, and he said, oh, girl, shut up. You know he's a racist. I said, yeah, that's right. And I went and said, you know, you know, Malcolm said, he said, girl, are you out of your mind? Huh, 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 get out of my face. You know, you know. I said, uh-huh. So that night at the party, because we worked hard, but we party weekends, you know what I mean? I mean, we partied. So that weekend at the party, we was side drive. I was out there, you know, you know, you know dancing with this brother. You know, and I said to this brother, I said, you know, Malcolm said, and he stopped and left me on the dance floor, just left me. And I looked up, I was out there by myself. And it's true, because I woke up alone to the rise and wind of history. I was alone like a whole lot of people were alone. You know, Baraka, a lot of people were alone because they had begun to listen to Malcolm, and he looked up and people were dropping like flies and people just dropping away. And some of us had then, to, uh, as artists, had to then begin to gravitate towards each other to stay alive in this country. You know, such pain when I think about that, you know? <sighs> that how we allow this country to wipe out people who could have helped us so much. It would have been a wise country if it allowed Malcolm to stay alive, people. It would be a different country today. <laughs> What can you say after an hour and a half of um, enlightened, liberated, in-depth discussion such as we've experienced? But thank you. It'll get better, eBay, yay.
Can you say eBay yay? Yeah, yeah. Can you really say eBay yay yeah, 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 yeah. When you sometimes feeling down and you really don't feel like you're going to make it, the reason why eBay yay is such a good sound is that it penetrates the body and makes you feel healthy. Say it sometimes, okay? It'll help you get through the day. Ibe Yiye, take care. Okay. Again, thank you very much. This concludes our morning with Sonia Sanchez. Uh, I'd like to thank all of you for coming out and being an attentive audience. There's a special thanks I'd like to offer, and that's to Brother Arturo Fister's poetry class. The brothers and sisters who assisted me in helping to establish this, this environment, I submit my dearest thanks. Also to the Louisiana League of Good Government, who assisted me and, in fact, allowed me in, uh, to, to bring Sonia to your, uh, to your attention. Thank you. Thank you, and have a good day.